Oklahoma is the land of second chances. Who were the people that made it so? We'll dig for the golden threads they've woven through Oklahoma history. The Red River Institute and Atwood's Ranch and Home are proud to present Oklahoma Gold. I'm Gwen Falconer Lippert, along with award-winning author and Southern Nazarene University historian, John J. Dwyer. We'll find the golden nuggets of Oklahoma history here now Oklahoma Gold. She was the queen of rockabilly. John J. Dwyer, what is that and who is that? Well, it's remarkable music and it's a remarkable woman, Gwen. Um, she played a, a central role, in fact, in building Oklahoma's legacy as one of the great producers of music and singers in the world. Beautiful Maud, that's M-A-U-D, Maud, Oklahoma native, Wanda Jackson, sang with power and passion in a career that lasted, get this, nearly two-thirds of a century. During that time, she reshaped modern music itself. So let's go back. Uh, to, to the origin story. Like tens of thousands of other Oklahomans, Wanda Jackson and her family moved to California in the 1940s. In fact, as we talk about in Volume 2 of the Oklahomans, uh, there were actually about twice as many Oklahomans moved to California in the 40s as did in the 30s. Uh, the Great Depression was far from over in the 1940s. Her, her musician father, Tom hoped for better prospects for his family, and he located the Jacksons in Bakersfield, in that great central California valley, which was becoming virtually uh, an Oklahoma colony. The area strongly supported country and western artists of the day, including Bob Wills and Spade Cooley. These were both nationally known A-list music people in that generation. Uh, renowned vocalists who had strong Oklahoma connections, family connections, and everything else. Hearing them as a girl left an indelible impression on Wanda Jackson. So did the guitar that her father insightfully bought for her from a pawn shop when she was seven years old and himself taught her to play. So parents, you never know. Put that extra work in. Make those children a priority. You might have the next Wanda Jackson. <laughs> Well, a few years later, after the war in 1948, they'd actually only been there less than five years as the American economy at long last got past the Great Depression, Wanda Jackson's father moved the family back to Oklahoma. And he, they were not the only family that came back realizing that the fields weren't greener after all out in California. There's a lot of false advertising, propaganda, flyers that were distributed. Uh, they tried to get everybody out there. Uh, you know, multiple times as many people that, as they needed for particular jobs, and then they would just lowball the price, you know, whether it was working in the uh, orange and apple orchards, factories, or whatever. So a lot of the Oklahomans wound up coming back. The Jacksons lived in the blue-collar south side of the city, Gwen, Oklahoma City. They lived south of the North Canadian River. Generations of Southsiders, and I know those of you out there that, that grew up, Capitol Hill, U.S. Grant, Southeast, uh, even more, uh, know some of these names. The Southsiders were mocked behind their backs and sometimes to their faces at, with names like Cracker, Redneck, and Southside River Rat. So that's where Wanda Jackson grew up. But her rare and brilliant natural vocal power, pitch, and control landed her on the community's dominant country music station, KLPR, right smack in the middle of Capitol Hill. This, in turn, got her heard by a uh, singer I know you're familiar with, Gwen, Hank Thompson, who was actually then living in Oklahoma City. His band, the Brazos Valley Boys, was named, and this was right in the middle of this run, the top country and western band in America for 14 straight years by Billboard magazine. So this man was at the top of the profession, living, uh, providentially, you might say, in the neighborhoods where Wanda Jackson was living. And while still a young teenager attending Capitol Hill High School, which also was one of the greatest athletic powerhouses in the Southwest, Jackson began recording songs with Thompson and his band on Capitol Records, one of the elite labels in the entire industry. Her duet, You Can't Have My Love, with 
Thompson's band leader, Billy Gray, reached number eight on the American country music charts, and it was during Wanda's junior year at Capitol Hill High School. She started, started uh, professionally singing at age 14, so she was already up to number eight on the charts by her junior year. Following her high school graduation the next year, she began touring. Her father served as her manager and chaperone. Still a teenager, of course, she frequently shared the same playbill as a teenager, 16, 17, 18-year-old young lady. And are you ready for this? Elvis Presley. In fact, the two became good friends and actually dated for a while. And if you look at pictures of Wanda from the era, it's not hard to see why. <laughs> On top of possessing a dynamic personality, compelling drive, and shrewd and creative intellect, she was one of the most beautiful women in music. And her close friend, Presley, crucially shaped her career. It was he that suggested that she sing Rockabilly, a new and original American blend of country, pop, rock and roll, and rhythm and blues. Presley, Johnny Cash, and Buddy Holly were the ones that spearheaded its rise. Jackson told Emmy Award-winning journalist Dick Pryor of Norman, and I quote now, uh, Wanda Jackson, as she remembered back, I didn't think I could do it, Rockabilly, but Elvis said, I think you can. We were in Memphis one time, singing that night. That afternoon, he took me to his home. We played records. He got out a guitar and sang, and kind of started giving me the idea of how you could take a song and do it in your own style, and make it rockabilly. So he was telling her that. Wanda, you can take a song and do it in your style and make it rockabilly. And then back to her quote, he wanted just to stretch me and have me be more than what I thought I was. I've loved him for that ever since. So, how'd you like to be a teenage girl from Oklahoma <laughs> <laughs> and what many would have even called the wrong side of the tracks in Oklahoma? and receive personal and insightful counsel about your own career from the king. The king himself. The king. <laughs> well, and as I understand it, Hank Thompson heard Wanda's booming voice on the station here in South Oklahoma City, and so he tracked her home number down at the radio station, called her, and invited her to join him that evening on stage in his concert. She said, Well, sir, I would be happy to but I will have to ask my parents first. Your parents, Thompson asked, bewildered. How old are you? I'm 14. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the midst of all this, she became the foremost female rockabilly vocal pioneer in the world. Uh, meanwhile, managing to succeed at country, rockabilly, and rock and roll alike, these very genres broadened her appeal and reach, and they all contributed to the success of one another. Now, while Tom Jackson, her daddy, was managing her, her Oklahoma mother that you referred to, Gwen, Nellie, designed many of her outfits. So this truly was a family affair. I can't think of a better way. If you're going to be in the music business and go on the road as a young person, to have mama and daddy with you is probably not a bad way to start. And in fact, Nellie created a more glamorous style. She didn't just dress her, she created a glamorous style for her daughter that had not yet been prevalent among female country and western vocalists. And if you go to johnjdwyer.com, you can see photos of Wanda Jackson as well. This is Oklahoma Gold. We'll have more about the Queen of Rockabilly when we come back. She's known as the Queen of Rockabilly, and her career continues after 67 years. John J. Dwyer, tell us more about Wanda Jackson. Well, as we talked about a moment ago, Gwen, Mama and Daddy were right there with her. Dad was manager and, and directing her career, and her mom was, was creating uh, show and stage outfits, performance outfits, that were really a cut way above what had been seen before in the country music female performers. Her outfits included fringe dresses, long earrings, and high heels. And Wanda Jackson said these outfits were the first for a female singer 
to put more glamour into country music, which, of course, you put glamour in along with their other uh, talents, and that, that, that just resulted in bigger record sales, bigger TV ratings. You can see several of these uh, outfits, by the way, in our Wanda Jackson Queen of Rockabilly blog on johnjdwyer.com uh, website, which you referenced earlier. We've also got great photos of Wanda at the top of her game, kicking it on national network TV with Hard-Headed Woman in 1958 and singing Fujiyama Mama in Japan, where that song hit number one in a country that America had dropped nuclear bombs on just more than a decade before. So if you don't think her reach has been great across the world, it has. Well, throughout the late 50s, Wanda Jackson recorded influential genre-shaping rock and roll songs as well as rockabilly hits with her lilting, upbeat voice. And those rockabilly hits included I Gotta Know, which hit number 15 in 1956, and I'm guessing that's got to be at around the age of 15 or 16, and the aforementioned Fujiyama Mama. And that song, Fujiyama Mama, was where she first unleashed her famous growl. I'm not sure if mom or dad taught her that one, but the, the audiences loved it. So do you get the feeling that music had never seen anyone quite like Wanda Jackson of Maud, Oklahoma? She also co-starred for five years on the national ABC TV network's Ozark Jubilee Show. She gained the sobriquet of the Queen of Rockabilly in the 1960s. Thirty of her country songs charted several in the top 10, stretching through the years 1954 all the way to 1974. She also had a string of top 40 rock hits. She was twice nominated for the Grammy Award for Best Country Vocal Performance by a Female. Well, by the 1980s, Wanda Jackson had won, in addition to everything else, a large European following. The countries where she would have sold-out concerts uh, where no one was American. They were, they were in different countries across Europe. So rich was her treasury of song and musical innovation that new waves of fans and TV, radio, recording, and film influence arose, continuing all the way to the present. And as late as 2012, in fact, her album Unfinished Business landed her on the Billboard country chart after, at that point, a break in her career of 39 years. Well, Gwen, we haven't really said much about uh, Wanda Jackson's offstage life during her career, and that's going to kind of lead into our golden nugget this time around, other than we did talk some about her friendship with Elvis, which was an enduring one. But on the personal front, Jackson married Wendell Goodson in 1961 and remained wed to him for 56 years. What a great feat in this day and time. That's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, can't think of a, of, a, of a more outstanding tribute to a man or woman than to have a marriage that long, especially when you're in show business. In fact, until he died in 2017. They had two daughters, and those daughters' influence led to a momentous 1971 event. Among Jackson's recollections to uh, our friend, Oklahoma journalist uh, Dick Pryor on that OETA program, she told Dick Pryor this, Our marriage was in trouble. One weekend, when Wendell and I were in town, our daughters made us promise to be in church that Sunday. God spoke to us at the end of that service. We publicly went forward and dedicated the rest of our lives to Christ. That made all the difference. The wall between us just dissolved. Because all of a sudden, when both parties want to please God and not themselves or somebody else, then it just takes that load off you. Well, this personal decision resulted not only in a fresh approach to life for Wanda and Wendell, but a series of gospel recordings by this one-of-a-kind Oklahoma music trailblazer and legend. Now into the 2020s, she remains elegant, lovely, and devout, the essence of Southern grace, and in the words of no less than an admiring Bob Dylan, a hurricane with lips. And Gwen, I believe you actually have a second golden nugget for us to close out the show. We know from a good source that she is continuing her career and she will release this next spring a new album produced by Joan Jett. But something that goes along with what you were saying in the Golden Nugget, and uh, this was sent to me by her good friend Brian Mon, Oklahoma County Commissioner. Following her 2009 induction 
into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Wanda got back on a plane like she's done thousands of times over her 67-year career and headed back to Oklahoma, where she still lives in South Oklahoma City. Now that's Oklahoma Gold. Woo!